All right, we're back at 12 minutes after the hour. You are looking at a live shot of the National Debt Clock right here in New York City. Check it out. Right now, the tally, more than $11 trillion and counting every second that goes by. Now, it works out to about $38,000 for you, me, and each and every American. And just out today, the U.S. budget deficit hitting a record $1.27 trillion for the current fiscal year, and that's just so far, is $2 trillion just a matter of time. Well, anyway, you cut it, the numbers are staggering, and one way or another, we're all going to have to pay for it. Well, joining us right now to talk about the dangers of the deficit, Dave Walker in studio. He is the president and CEO of the Peter G. Peterson Foundation and the former Comptroller General and head of the Government Accountability Office. Over in Boston, we've got Jeffrey Myron. He's a senior lecturer in economics at Harvard University. And joining us from our Washington newsroom is Dan Collender. He is the managing director of Corvus Communications and a former House and Senate budget analyst. So let's talk about uh, the, the, the deficit. Um, the projection is it's going to be about four times what it was last year. Stan, let me start with you. Doesn't that trouble you? You're a taxpayer. You're, doesn't that worry you? Yeah, actually, it doesn't. Um, I know David and I are going to disagree a little bit about this in terms of the long term, but um, short term, it's exactly the right fiscal policy for what's currently going on. The issue is not what's happening now or how big the deficit is this moment. It's what's going to happen when the economy starts to turn around. If you heard the previous interview with Jared Bernstein, he said once the economy turns around, the administration is going to have to turn on not a dime, but on a trillion dollars. That's what we have to be watching for, not what's happening currently. All right, David, got any thoughts here? Well, the problem is not the short-term deficits because a lot of that is because of stimulating the economy or dealing with unprecedented that. bailouts. We need to do that. Although there's been a lot of money wasted on that, quite frankly. The problem is the almost $50 trillion in off-balance sheet obligations that we have, unfunded Medicare obligations, unfunded Social Security. And by the way, those aren't being addressed in any meaningful way by so-called health care reform. All right, so you're saying things are much worse than we're even yeah, we're talking about. Professor Myron, I want to bring you into this. Are things much worse than we're even talking about? Those numbers are pretty staggering. I think they are much worse. Uh, I agree that in the short term, the deficits are not a huge deal one way or the other, whether you think they're good or bad. The short term is not the, the issue. But the long term issue with Medicare and Social Security is huge. It's probably even worse than the existing projections. The issue for the administration's health care reform is that it's not reform. It's not going to control costs in existing programs or the new programs. It's just more government health care. So that means the deficit situations are probably much worse than anybody's admitting right now. Yeah, I think we have to keep in mind, you can't reduce health care costs by expanding coverage. They're not taking exactly. on the tough issues. We have $38 trillion of unfunded obligations for Medicare already, and they want to expand coverage and just pay for it. When are we going to start taking steps that we can deliver on the promises we've already made? Stan, what do you think here? Because, you know, there are folks out who say, you know, this is certainly a problem we have to deal with health care, and that what we're talking about will eventually rein in some of those costs. I mean, already, you know, you have somebody go to the emergency room, it's going to cost a heck of a lot more than if they did some uh, planning ahead of time to kind of prevent, you know, preventive care. I mean, what do you think here on this front? Well, I mean, look, first of all, they're, uh, both David and, and, and Jeff are exactly right. We're talking about a longer-term issue, um, and, and he, he, no one's really looking at the full cost of, men, uh, of expanding coverage to 47, addition, 47 million additional people. Um, but I am very skeptical about long-term budget forecasts, long-term basically being past lunch tomorrow. Um, you know, the, the world changes very, very quickly these days, um, and I just, don't, I just don't find, I cannot get exercised over 40 or 50-year projections um, when we're going to have trouble just getting through this year. Uh, admit we have to look somewhat long term, but when you talk past the next election, past the next two elections, there are going to be countless wars, foreign military problems, uh, God knows what else that's going to pop up, natural disasters, so, and none of the projections we have currently mean much of anything past about two so years. So wait, now. we've got a chart that's actually looking at future deficit. You know, we show what happens from 2008 to 2009. There's a dramatic jump we all know about, about four times what it was in 2008. 2010, it's also a pretty ugly number. Here's, here it is for our viewers. Um, and this is kind of the growth. But as you look at it, something like 2015, the deficit, we start to see a big cut. Now, Stan, you're saying that you don't really trust these numbers? 
Well, certainly 2015, uh, you're talking about two presidential elections are just about from now. Um, and you're talking about a, a projection that's based on current law, not on what's actually likely to happen. Um, I, you know, you can do a straight line extrapolation like that. I just don't think it means that much. But let me, let me, let me be you know, clear. I'm not saying don't worry about it. I'm just saying I can't get exercised about how big the numbers look 20 or 30 years from now because I just don't believe that they're going to be accurate. It could be much worse or much better. Well, let's talk about creditworthiness. The S&P downgraded the AAA outlook for the United Kingdom back in May. Mm -hmm. If you look at our deficits to GDP, debt to GDP, off balance sheet obligations to GDP, uh, foreign lending to GDP, savings to GDP, we're worse. Right. We're worse. Than the UK. But, we're worse but than David, the UK. How, David, how come the bond market isn't responding because to that? Because we have home team bias and because people are myopic. Very myopic, and so are markets. Jeff, I want to bring you into if this. I can, yeah, if I can weigh in, I certainly agree that the long term forecasts tend to be uncertain, but I think all of the biases in the process, all the biases in the politics are to understate how bad it's going to be. We do projections, say, of tax revenue from tax increases. By construction, the CBO is not allowed to take account of the dynamic response, so we always overstate how much tax revenue we're going to get from tax increases. We do have a pretty long track record to forecasting Medicare expenditures based on demographics and the rate of increase of, uh, of health inflation. Those have been very stable and are easy to forecast. And we see that every time we forecast it, we're wrong on the low side. So, yes, there's uncertainty, but I think we know which could, direction that uncertainty is going to get Could we also be, be understating what kind of growth we see going forward? Um, you know, let's assume that the economy eventually is going to get back on track and we start to see growth. I mean, it's going to change the equation, isn't it going it, to? It, Sure it is, but in order to grow your way out of the federal financial hole, you would have to have double-digit real GDP growth every year for decades. It hasn't happened. The hole it isn't that we're currently happen. in. The hole that we're currently in. I'm not talking about the deficit. I'm talking about the unfunded obligations. Look, President Obama was right when he said that we're going to have to make some tough choices on taxes, entitlement reform, budget controls. My question is, what's his plan to get us there? Stan, you know, the, what, the president hasn't really talked. I mean, a lot of people I hear, the thing that does bother them is they're saying there is no plan to cut the deficit. There's no plan out there. I mean, we're not hearing much on that front. Well, I mean, first of all, I would be shocked and surprised if the president was trying to muddy the political waters currently by talking about what he's going to do in two years or a year from now, uh, you know, about, about the deficit. In other words, he doesn't have to propose a plan yet. Um, he, he will do it probably in the next budget, which will come out next February. Um, you know, let me just comment quickly on what David said. He's exactly right. We're not going to grow our way out of this. And, and what's going to have to happen is that the government's going to have to decide to stop doing some things. That is, it can't continue to do everything it's currently doing, expect to be able to raise taxes to pay for it, um, and for that to be politically acceptable. Right. But understand what I'm saying. Some right. of the things the government's going to have to stop doing is going to be very difficult politically. All right. Sit tight, everybody. Stan, Jeff, David, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking about the dangers of the deficit on Bloomberg Television. 20 minutes after, we're back in two minutes' time. Those numbers ticking away. That's the national uh, debt uh, over $11 trillion. We're talking right now about the dangers of the deficit. I want to get back uh, right into our discussion. And Jeff, I want to bring you back into it. I mean, we've got a graphic that looks at the debt as a percentage of GDP. I mean, uh, the national debt definitely growing. I mean, when you look at something like that, um, you got to be concerned. Absolutely. And you have to be concerned in large part because a lot of what we're spending money on in my view, is not especially productive. If we had a currently high debt and we were doing something with all that expenditure that was really making the economy productive, generating the revenue to pay back that debt, that's one thing. But I don't think that's the case. What I think specifically, a lot of the expenditures what specifically, incredibly what specifically bothers you in terms of those expe expe expenditures? Okay, well, in my view, a huge amount of things. I think we're spending way too much on national defense, fighting wars that we're never going to win. I think we're spending way too much on health care um, in, in ways that are very similar to the ways the administration is emphasizing. They're absolutely right that there's a huge amount of waste in our current system. Where I disagree with them is how we're going to fix that. They want to fix it by giving out more health insurance. That's insane. I think we have to fix it by rolling back the existing health insurance plans, more co-pays, more deductibles, possibly a higher age of eligibility for Medicare and things 
things like that. Stan, but it's well, across it's the board. The problem is that the, the only two really, really big things are national defense and health. Stan, all issues that need to be dealt with in your view? Uh, look, yeah, Jeff's exactly right. I mean, uh, you, you, it's always better to borrow for something that will provide a return. No one would argue that a big mortgage is, is a bad debt as long as you're, you, you've got enough to be able to make the payments every month and the value of the house is worth more than the value of the mortgage. The problem here, as Jeff suggested, is we're borrowing for things that don't pay a return in terms of dollars. Now, you've got to understand that there are other reasons the government, especially the federal government, spends and defense is one of them. That's about as pure a public good as you could possibly get. Your sign look, over here, David. I mean, if you look at health Healthcare, we spend double per capita of any other nation on earth. We have below average results, the highest uninsured population. It's not a matter of money. We're spending too much money. Uh, we need to dramatically re engineer the system. And by the way, we've already got a house. If you want to count the healthcare system as a house, it's already mortgaged for more than it's worth. We're not trying to right. figure out how we're going to be able to pay that money. All right. So you guys, it seems like there's at least a consensus that there's too much spending going on generally. And it's not just this administration. It's been going on for several Absolutely. years. Let's talk Absolutely. about what we need to do going forward. I mean, Stan, is it a case that we have no, no doubt about it? We can't avoid raising taxes here to get out of this? No, look, I mean, first of all, there's always two ways to reduce, uh, fix the budget. And one is to cut spending. The other is to increase taxes. My guess is it'll be a combination of both. And, um, you know, as I said a few minutes ago, the government's going to have to be facing some difficult choices about stopping to do some things. Does it really need to spend as much on agriculture or, as David suggested, on health care? Um, you know, there are some things that it's just not going to be able to do unless people are willing to tolerate these deficits, which at some point, David's exactly right, one of the people lending us money is going to say, no, Moss, we're not lending you anymore. That will create a huge problem economically. You're talking about the Chinese, right? The Chinese, the Japanese, the Saudis, the UK, the, you know, I mean, the Norwegians, the South Africans, anybody who lends us money. Jeff, uh, we've just got a few seconds left here. I mean, the deficit, though, a necessary evil to kind of get to this point, get the economy going again, and then we've got to address it. Well, I mean, part of the deficit is the necessary evil or the allegedly necessary evil, but a huge part of the deficit are these longer-term things that we've not made decisions about. I totally agree with Stan. We have to start thinking about making choices, and the tone from Congress and administration has been that we don't have to do that, that somehow there are these magic bullets out there that are going to reform health care and save money while covering 45 million more people. That's just fantasy, and we have to get past that before we can have reasonable discussions. Yeah. All right, but health care has been costing a lot of folks here, you know, a lot of money, David. We've got to do something with with the plan. We do, but we need a health care plan that will save us money, not cost us money. We need to not just pay for health care expansion. We need to make a big down payment on the tens of trillions of unfunded obligations we already have. Uh, you know, look, it's, I'll, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for more coverage today. But Tuesday never comes. <laughs> All right. We could go on forever about this, but we got to run. Dave Walker, Jeff Myron, and uh, Stan Collender, thank you so much for talking about the deficit. We appreciate it.